not exactly hidden. The moment he touches the first glowing spore, his mind is sent tumbling down the rabbit hole. He's only vaguely aware that he's marching towards the heart of this changed forest. He is young, younger than he has ever recalled before, the masked face of a doctor, the tears of relief and joy washing away the pain in his mother's face, his father's joyful expression, his grandfather smiling in the corner, there with his family, but at respectful distance so that he does not intrude in a happy moment between mother, father, and child. His eyes nearly bug out physically and he staggers a little. His mind is opening, widening. The bright forest is so very different from the dark forest. It, it is expanding his mind. He is tiny, not as small as the previous memory. He cannot stand, he cannot speak. He has little concept of either. Somehow his grandfather has vanished right in front of him. His tiny mind cannot comprehend how. He did not see him move behind anything or leave. He is simply gone. There is a kiss on the top of his head and he leans back to look up into the smiling and wizened face of the old man. A great laugh erupts from him and his hands clap together. It is a good game. Eyes opened at last refuse to so much as blink. Very well then. Let us both learn. There is much I have forgotten. Remind me, O oh forest, let us both be made more. Koga says to the shivering and shifting forest, in this fortress without walls, he is safe and strong. He is small, very small, but larger than before. He can stand and run and race, but he has learned of something terrible. That cold, hard water can fall from above and it can hurt when it happens. He learns a new word, Cory, ice or hail. It hurts when hail falls upon you. His gaze is drawn upwards as he senses the caps of the mushrooms grow thicker to better shield him. They grow and a path is formed to keep him from all rain. The bright forest is just as kindly and caring as the dark forest. It wishes him well, but, but that can be its own danger. He is small but larger than before. His day has been terrible. He has met others and spoken to them and they have mocked him. He is too slow, he is too clumsy, he is too stupid, and he is too ugly to play. No one wants him, no one cares for him. An old hand is upon his shoulder and he looks back to see his grandfather. Sa, kunrin no jikandesu. Come, it is time to train. He sniffs and nods. He trusts his grandfather. The others may be cruel, but family has never once been so. There is a question in the air. The forest wants to know, needs to know more. It had tasted desperation and loneliness from the memories of another. Now it senses something different from him, a careful cultivation of strength through compassion. There is shouting in the home. Things twist around and the argument turns to questions followed by a laugh. Father comes in and quickly, the little place his grandfather told him to keep the practice weapon is opened and the shining steel is taken out. My sigh, you are too young to have weapons, my son, father tells me. Everything is a weapon in the right hands, Daiki had protested. Then you do not need this. Father answers and refuses to hear anything else. Time passes and the mood is strange. The fact he had a weapon had brought up another piece of news. There will be another member of the family soon. Grandfather's smile is undisturbed by this shift and the anger of father and mother. And so Daiki learned another lesson of resilience and stoic grace. The old troublemaker taught me as much, if not more than my father did. Not that my father did not teach me much. I was truly blessed in my circumstances. Many would pity the small, busy family I had, but I would not trade a moment with them for all the riches in the heavens. Koga notes out loud. He is not so small now, but there is one smaller still before him. His sister, so tiny and frail, she is struggling to even stand. It had been more than a year since he lost his weapon, but his grandfather had told him such things were merely a test of resolve, that all problems in life were merely that, tests, tests to see if you can rise above them. And rise he did. 
He practiced with the post until his hands bled. He practiced his throw until he could strike any part of the target from ten paces with stone, stick, or bent shuriken coin. He practiced his expressions with the mirror until he could fool even himself. And now it came to play. With but a smile, his sister, so very small and so very precious, she would laugh at his smile. Even if he was feeling bored or just not interested, he could make her feel wondrous. Mother said that the time of the shinobi was done, that the Koga clan was just a spread-out family with a proud history. Praiseworthy, but no longer the loyal servants of Shogun from the days of old. But Daiki, Daiki did not agree. The expressions to control another's feelings already soothed his sister. The training strengthened his body, and now he was eagerly sought by others in play. When news had come of more people being attacked by knives, Grandfather had led everyone into lessons on how to defend from them. The lessons of old were still of worth in a changing world. The time of Shinobi may be over, but the lessons of the ninja were timeless. The sensation of growth and new ideas flows past him, a train of thought so thick it has physical presence on the air. Yes, old things are of great value. There is wisdom in the past and its strength must be used to carry yourself forward. He is older now, his limbs have grown long and lanky. This day he has met his first Gaijin. He had thought the stranger was an Oni, red of skin curled and coiled of hair, massive in size and crude of feature. He had thought an ancient demon from the mountains had come down. But no, the man had been mugged and stolen from. His skin was burnt from the sunlight and turned a painful red. He spoke little Japanese, but what Koga could understand was enough to help the man to the police. He had been thanked many times and the police had promised to help the man. Two weeks later, he received a gift and thanks. It was money and not anything personal. The man did not know him well and could not make a proper gift, but he expressed his thanks regardless. Daiki used the money to buy his sister a birthday present. After all, the true gift was the lesson. Think twice and do not condemn on sight. The wisdom of patience. The forest seems to quiver a bit at that memory. Patience ill suits it. The bright forest wishes to grow and expand, to be more and consume and spread and, and he is watching his grandfather tend a tiny tree. It is carefully pruned and expertly carved. It is alive. It is also old, older than his grandfather, older than his grandfather's grandfather. A small tree, sacred and strong, but also so very fragile. It has lived so very long and yet is so very small. The lesson is on mindfulness, cultivation, and careful action. Any fool can cut a tree, but to prune a bonsai, more is needed. The lesson stings. Daiki had been dragged into a fight. The troublemakers of his school had come with a baseball bat. Daiki had shattered the hardened but brittle wood over the other boys' bottoms. Daiki had felt like a champion, like a samurai fresh from the battlefield. Then the teachers had arrived and the warm sensation had turned icy cold. The wisdom is from both father and grandfather this time. Though he had won the fight, though he had laid his enemies low and conquered them, he had lost the true battle. The other had sought to drag him down, to lay low his reputation and potential, and they had done so. By fighting back against a foe who craved the battle, he had let them win. Daiki does not like the idea of running, thinking it would make him seem cowardly. Then an important question is asked. Bakaga do omukanante nande ki nisuru no? Why do you care what a fool thinks? He has no answer to that question. Then his lack of answer tells him everything. He had lost. He had fallen to the goading and jibes of an imbecile and proven himself equally imbecilic. The shame burns like hot coals in his gut. The forest seems to pause at that revelation. Then it shares something with him, something it had gained from another. Morg Arkan watches the parade with wide eyes. 
his hands grasping his mother's horns for support as his tiny feet use her tail to stand. Fire is filling the sky in every shade of battle, reds and blues, greens and white, but there is something off, something parting the flames. It comes from the smallest of the procession. She is dressed in a simple blouse and skirt. She is barefoot and small. There is no jewelry upon her. Her outfit has no adornments and there is no symbol of office nor sensation of power. When she opens her mouth, no fire erupts, but all other flames are flattened and the sensation of heat spreads over the crowd. There's the smell of smoke as small fires give off and everyone goes silent as the small, unassuming woman passes by. Who was that? Morg Arkin asks his mother. Compared to all the other in their magnificent dresses, beautiful sparkling jewelry and astonishingly beautiful faces, this plain small woman stands out as the only unadorned and unimportant looking piece of a grand masterwork. That was the Empress, strongest of us all. She didn't look strong, he says. Her arms appear tiny. Her height and horns are unimpressive. Her stride, while purposeful, isn't especially anything. To his eyes, she seems to be simply someone who had come out from the crowd to walk in a strange gap in the festivities. She doesn't have to. She has nothing to prove to anyone. Her warfire is beyond color, her strength beyond compare. Her wisdom without an equal and her patience is without bounds. She needs nothing more than herself. She knows it. We know it. She is an example to us all. Morgarkun watches in fascination as the strange, unadorned central piece to the entire parade walks past. No escort, no float, not even music of her own. She stands alone and apart from all the others, needing none of it, for she is above it. That, that's not a bad comparison, Koga admits as he walks into a central clearing. The sensation of the bright forest is immense in this place. He can feel the dark forest within him, reaching out eagerly. It wishes to speak to the bright forest as much as he does. Strength is something you have, something you earn and cultivate. It cannot be simply given to you, and the grandest displays of strength are often the biggest signs of weakness. The powerful and mighty need not remind anyone what they are, for they simply are. The central mushroom has a whirl of foreign material in it. This is the place. This is something sacred and strong, where parasite turned symbiote turned sucker. He sits at the foot of the grand mushroom, a carpet of tightly woven mycelium beneath him. He turns his gaze inwards and invites the bright forest in. There is no conflict. From afar, the dark forest reaches out and fills him, to mix with the glowing strength of the newly born bright forest. They dance around each other and play, swirling and meeting but never combining. They are distinct and strong. The wisdom of the ancient buoyed and bettered by the curiosity of the young. The eagerness of the newborn is tempered by the patience of the old. In the center is Koga, the newborn, the child, the boy, the teenager, Koga, Kore ga tadashi kotoda to kakushin shite imasu ka? His father asks and Daiki nods. He is resolute. Are you sure this is the right thing to do? Hi, shite imasu. Yes, I am. He says with finality and the look of concern shifts into one of fierce pride. Even if you fail my son, know that I am proud. This path is not an easy one, but it is the hardest paths that lead to the greatest achievements his father says before his grandfather chuckles from his seat on the deck nearby. Though do try to not fail grandson. If you do, I'll double your training, the old ninja states. The years are starting to weigh him down. But his eyes have lost none of their spark despite all the wrinkles that surround them. Father, could I please have this moment? Daiki's father asks, and it's an effort of will not to start laughing. I've already given you two. Don't be greedy, Grandfather protests, and Daiki loses the battle and starts giggling like a child. Ha! Huh. But that was barely the beginning. There was so much more, 
more that both dark and bright Forrest eagerly learned from. Sweat poured from his brow. His everything hurt. His hair hurt. That wasn't supposed to be something that hurt. The day had at first seemed to be threatening rain, but now it was a taunt. The physical exercises were only half finished, and some small part of Daiki prayed for the sweet release of death, or at least a rain shower to cool and soothe his aching body and weeping soul. It had been hard, yes, but in the end it had been so very worth it. He looks through his glasses to the mirror in astonishment. He had never not been trim and strong, but now it had been taken to an extreme. Had it really only been two years? He stretched back and contorts as if he had trained his whole life to bend. Next to him is a man who simply cannot look away from the mirror as he tries to find evidence of a belly that has long since been stripped away. So many had failed, so many had fallen, and many times Daiki thought he would be next. But he had persevered. Like all good changes, it went beyond the body. It had reached the mind as well. Strength of character was what the trainers were truly looking for. People with a diamond hard core of resilience. The rest could be taught. But that will was absolutely required. I think we all sound like bumpkins and rubes, Koga states in mechanical and stilted galactic trade. They were not allowed to use any human language today. It was nothing but the alien trade tongue. He flips the page of his enormous technical manual. A language to learn, a body to train, weapons to practice with, a ship to both construct and familiarize yourself with. The list of duties was immense, but they were rising to the challenge. And rise they did, out of Earth and into the stars. The trip had been perilous, boring and fascinating all at once. He goes through the mudra again this time followed by others, many others. The lessons of his family had helped keep him focused and disciplined in this place where up and down held no meaning. In this time where time did not exist, the ship was well made and only so many could be on janitorial duty at once. So other distractions were needed. It was a joke for the most part, but it brought him closer to his fellows. The Koga Ninja clan lived in zero gravity, a clan of brothers, not of blood, but of bond. Granted, the bond was in seeing how much one could get away with without the officers finding out. But it was a bond nonetheless. His grandfather would be very proud of him. Yes, the old man would be proud. And that brought up a great warmth in Koga, one that both Forrest nestled into and curled up within him. His location shifts. He is at one outside edge of the now glowing forest, startling the artisans who have come to examine their livelihoods change. He gives them a short nod and then is gone to the other end. The ocean far below the cliff face roils and churns as the rains are being twisted into a storm. Then he is back in the center and focuses. It takes time. The dark forest is further away and drawing more of it into himself is neither simple nor swift. But he does so, and when he opens his eyes once more, he is beneath the titanic boughs that choke out the sun. He nods to himself and focuses again. It takes time once more. The process is not something that can be rushed. But in time, he realigns and he is once more in the bright forest. His eyes open, the pupils glow with phosphor as well now. This will take a great deal of patience to teach the others, but it will be worth it. Both forests agree.